Hey there, spoiler warning, both this video and the ROM hack I'm reviewing contain spoilers for Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. If that's the sort of thing you would rather avoid, then I will see you next week. Stay safe, gamers. The Black Knight from Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn is an iconic Fire Emblem villain. In Path of Radiance, he shows up as a mysterious invincible figure, kills your dad, chases you around a bunch, and eventually leads to climactic confrontation in a crumbling tower. But somehow he survives death and comes back as an actual playable unit in the sequel Radiant Dawn. Well, he's playable for like 5 seconds on two maps. Radiant Dawn's weird structure makes it so that he's not a permanent member of any of your armies. But I remember when I was at summer camp and Radiant Dawn had come out but I hadn't had the chance to play it yet, one of my friends told me that in this game you can actually play as the Black Knight. And I thought that was such a cool concept! Well, apparently I'm not the only one, because friend of the channel Retina made a ROM hack, Code of the Burger King. And in this hack, not only can you control the Black Knight for more than 5 seconds, he's actually your main lord. And if that sounds like a cool concept to you, then don't worry, it gets even better. Let's start with the elephant in the room. Code of the Burger King is a comedy hack. Basically, every prominent ROM hacking community has some number of comedy hacks, and the Fire Emblem ROM hacking community is no different. I will admit to some bias here, I'm not a huge fan of comedy hacks. There are two main reasons for this. The first is my primary engagement with video games is playing them. While a good story will definitely elevate a game for me, at the end of the day my priority is having fun. I find that often comedy hacks work their jokes into the gameplay in ways that can detract from an otherwise tailored experience. The second is much more subjective, but I honestly don't think gamers are as funny as they think they are, especially Fire Emblem gamers. And like, I'm as guilty of this as anyone in the community. But repeating what happened to Dorcas and or I could use the warp staff is not peak comedy. In the past, I've played comedy hacks in the Pokemon, Mario, and Fire Emblem series. And my general experience with ROM hacking humor is, at best, a couple of chuckles, and at worst, cringing at the repetitive punchlines of, haha, I made a character say fuck. Now let's do drugs and alcohol, those are funny because they're mature adult things. I give you this context so that you know that it is a genuine accomplishment for Code of the Burger King to have made me not only laugh, but consistently do so. With gags like Charlo being the most annoying type of FE4 fan, Bernie Sanders, Sans Undertale, and Bernadetta getting merged into Bernie Sandsters, who's an amalgamation of the three of them, Big Chungus and John Brown just sort of existing for some reason, and plenty of other jokes that really worked for me. Now, of course, humor is subjective, and it's very possible that it won't be as funny to you as it was to me. And I also don't think every single joke in the hack landed. Of particular note, I wasn't a fan of the running gag where everyone misgenders Sephiroth. It's something that Vanilla Fire Emblem has done a bunch as well, and I don't find it funny there either. And there were a couple of dementia jokes that felt like pretty poor taste, but overall I would say the humor lands more than it misses. Its particular style is a mend of Fire Emblem meme references and off-the-wall non-sequiturs. So that might help give a general idea of whether or not this one is for you, but I do definitely recommend giving the story a try, even if you are hesitant about comedy rom hacks. This one stands out among the bunch, and not just because its jokes are knee slappers. The gameplay is not compromised at all for the humor, and oftentimes feels elevated by it, actually. For example, one of the early game characters is Rebecca from Fire Emblem 7, and she finds a personal weapon that is a bow that shoots rapiers. This is a throwaway gag meant to poke fun at how many Lord's personal weapons are just effectively rapiers repurposed such as the Thani, the Regal Sword, the Wolf Bale, and the Regin. However, having a effective against Cavs and Armor's bow actually helps Rebecca, both as part of her early game kit and as a tool in her arsenal for one of her late game builds. Yes, I said one of, we'll get back to that. Another early game unit who benefits from this approach is Mathis, who is given the Provoke skill as a reference to the fact that in FE11, many people just kill him and move on. 
or perhaps it's meant to be punishment for him constantly killing Lena. Either way, it seems to be that he's the butt of the joke for having Provoke. However, Provoke is one of the most busted skills in the game, as it will guaranteed attract AI's attention no matter what. So this, in combination with a good starting class, as well as a personal weapon that grants him Paragon, allows Mathis to fulfill a very strong role in the meta, and makes him one of the more interesting units to use. And I'm not just saying that because I have a Lena profile picture and therefore am biased. Okay, I'm partially saying that because I have a Lena profile picture and therefore am biased. But that brings me into one of the more interesting parts of the gameplay, and that is what defines the units. While starting class growths and bases do still definitely matter, in Code of the Burger King, units are mostly defined by the unique combination of skills they have access to, as well as any personal weapons that they might have access to. Every unit starts with at least one skill and gains more on level ups. And while not all units have access to a secret event or personal weapon, many of them do and some even have multiple. For example, the game's Lord, the Black Knight, starts with Charisma, which is fairly standard Lord skill, but then gains Pivot at level 15 unpromoted to make up for the fact that he is still in an Armor Knight class, and Luna at level 10 promoted due to the fact that, well, he's the Black Knight, of course he was going to get some sort of Luna equivalent. He also gets the Etterd, and later in the story he gets access to the Espatulon, which is an infinite use 1-2 range sword. Now, it's not unusual for the Lord to have a focus on support skills and personal weapons, but the same applies to a lot of units in Code of the Burger King. Your early game mage, Hugh, is largely defined by his access to Despoil, which allows him to break the economy if you're willing to pump luck boosters into him. Train him enough and he gets Bargain at promoted level 10, which means suddenly you don't have to care about packing the silver cart. And about halfway through the game, he gets access to his personal weapon, the Mungus, which is a 1 use 20 range dark tome. Biggle is a playable monster, but effectively a flying summoner. This on its own is pretty strong, but upon reaching level 7 promoted, Biggle gains tome range plus 1, meaning suddenly it has access to 1 3 range dark magic in addition to Flight and Summons. Sephirin is an early game Light Mage, but if he levels up enough he gets access to the Convoy skill, meaning that he can dip in and out of the Convoy, getting whatever tomes or staves are best for his current situation. Alternatively, he gains access to the Dragon Flute, allowing him to sideways promote into Draco Pope, a unique class that he has access to and no one else can. I've already mentioned the rapier bow that Rebecca gets, however she also starts with Glacius, an incredibly powerful proc skill that actually gets around Nihil, boosting her damage based on her resistance stat. Suddenly it's not a dump stat. Additionally, upon leveling up more, she gets access to bow breaker and bow range plus one, meaning that she can outrange fellow snipers and if she does have to face them in an archer v archer battle, they're likely going to miss and she's likely going to hit. Of course, there is another use for Bowbreaker, and remember when I said alternative builds earlier? Well, this is where we have to start talking about one of the game's weirder but cooler additions, a wholly unique reclassing system. Every non-guided map in Code of the Burger King has a hidden item called a B-side located within it. These B-sides kind of function like second seals as they allow you to reclass, but instead of choosing what class you move into, you follow a set order within your class set. You see, Code of the Burger King units each have a class set similar to Shadow Dragon, where you have male 1, male 2, and female. However, unlike Shadow Dragon, the order of those classes is actually important, because using a B-side won't let you choose which class within your set to move into. Instead, you move directly into the next class in the set. So, for example, Hugh starts out as a mage, but if he uses a B-side upon hitting level 10, he will turn into a dark mage. And if he gets 10 more levels, he can use another B-side to become a troubadour and just keep moving down his class set until he loops back around to Mage. Much like in Awakening, your level being reset to 1 means you'll gain experience faster, 
but you miss out on the promotion bonuses you would get from using a master seal to promote. Instead, using a B-side will give you stat adjustments. You might lose some stats and gain some others. In addition to the trade-off between promotion and reclassing, you also have to think about when you're going to reclass. Technically speaking, Rebecca can reclass out of Archer and into Pegasus Knight as soon as she hits level 10. This would make her into your first flyer, and potentially allow her to be a flyer on several maps that have a lot of terrain. However, at level 13 on Promoted, she earns Bowbreaker, and a significant avoid boost against bows on a Pegasus Knight is a big appeal of making Rebecca into a flyer. Especially because with her personal bow, she can functionally become a Kinshi Knight. You see, while she can't bring regular bows into the Pegasus Knight class because she loses her bow rank, she does still retain her personal weapon, as do all characters no matter what class they're in. Reclassing opens up some truly wacky options, many of which are good, many of which are bad, and many of which are incredibly silly. But one of the weirdest and strongest interactions is how reclassing works for promoted units. Much like unpromoted units, promoted units need to wait until they're level 10 or higher to use a B-side. However, instead of their stats going both up and down as they adjust to the new class, their stats simply go up. If a promoted unit reclasses to their next promoted class, then they gain the stat gains as if they had promoted into that class. So for example, if you reclass into Sage, you gain Sage promotion bonuses. This can potentially allow you to give your pre-promotes a second promotion and just give them a flat stat boost. A popular candidate for this is Deke, who joins as a hero and can become a wyvern with some truly busted numbers. It is also worth noting that the promoted and unpromoted sets function differently from each other. So for example, while Archer Rebecca can reclass directly into Pegasus Knight, Sniper Rebecca cannot reclass into Falco Knight. This makes the reclassing decision even more interesting, as reclassing to an unpromoted class means delaying your promoted skills, but reclassing when promoted potentially misses out on a better class line. And the coolest thing about this system is just how optional it is. Because the B-sides are all hidden items in the kin of Desert Items or Radiant Dawn hidden items, I actually didn't interact with it at all until more than halfway through my first playthrough. I just didn't realize it exists. It's right there in the guide, but I didn't read the guide because I'm a real gamer. Who reads manuals? Not me. Gamer skills! No, I just didn't want to read a guide on stream. That felt like that would not make very good content. But despite missing out on reclassing and missing out on many of the secret characters, I was able to build my own army of weirdos and all of the units felt very distinct from each other, even the ones in the same classes. Of course, if you do find any secret characters, either by yourself or through a guide, you were in for an even weirder time than usual. Just as a preview for the first two, Wario is an Axe Cavalier who has voice selection commands similar to Echo's, and Ricardo is a thief who uses a gun, which is a brave magical weapon only he can use. Editing Danny here with a slight correction, the gun is not brave, it is just that Ricardo gets the skill Double Lion, which makes all of his attacks brave, once he hits level 15. But I've probably spent more than enough time talking about story, reclassing, and character uniqueness. Because at the end of the day, expertly crafted systems like this are only as good as the maps that they're present on. And, well, thankfully, Code of the Burger King has some banger maps. The shortest endorsement I can give for the maps and gameplay of Code of the Burger King is I started a new playthrough yesterday in order to try to get some footage for this review. My intention was simply to play through the first five or six chapters of the game, but I accidentally wasted an entire day playing through most of the campaign. Oops, maybe this video is going to be a little bit late. But we all fall into that life-destroying video game sinkhole sometimes. So what is it specifically about Code of the Burger King's maps and gameplay that is so appealing? Well, for starters, they've definitely got the fundamentals nailed. You almost always start out under some threat, with nearby enemies who need to be eliminated before the first enemy phase. The maps also have plenty of side objectives, encouraging you to split your forces, 
and in many cases there are anti-turtle reinforcements pushing you to move quickly. But this is all standard fare. Where Code of the Burger King really stands out is the intentionality in the weapon and enemy layouts. An early standard example is Chapter 4. You start staring down four scary cavaliers and an even scarier paladin, all of whom are just out of range of your starting position. But even this early, you have plenty of tools to counter them. The Zanbato and Rapier will deal effective damage, your Silver Lance will hit very hard, mages can attack uncountered and set up kills for others, and two of your units are Armor Knights, giving them the possibility of tanking a hit from any of the foes. But whatever you choose to do, you need to do it fast, because a recruitable red unit is running towards you, reinforcements will spawn soon, and there's a thief headed for the treasure room, and if you want to reach it in time, you will have to break a wall and deal with the Longbow General, who is capable of one-rounding most of your units at this point. But the Armor Slayer, Rapier, or your mages can make short work of him. Don't worry about using these tools so early, because the game will be very generous in giving you more, while at the same time throwing cruel challenges at you that require full usage of these resources. Make no mistake, enemies are scary, with generics holding things like silvers and devils very early on, and even some promoted enemies with cap strength or speed stats just to keep you on your toes. This is another reason why skill combinations feel more impactful than stats. It can be very difficult to get yourself to the point where you outstat groups of enemies. And when I say stat inflation, I do mean every stat. Enemies, including generics, will have quite high luck stats, and this means that generic enemies will often pull 1-2% crit on you, especially for the low luck units, which your army actually has quite a few of. But in another example of Burger King giving for everything it takes away, you get an early game Hoplon Guard, arriving on a recruitable unit in Chapter 2. Moreover, the first secret shop in the game does offer buyable Hoplon Guards, and I personally advise grabbing at least a couple of them. And luck isn't the only meme stat to be more important in this hack. When most mages are too bulky to be one-shot and magic hits very hard, having a decent or good resistance set becomes a very valuable niche, either for baiting them out or attacking them and taking the counter. The only meme stat that doesn't get a significant buff is skill, mostly because weapon hit rates are in general pretty high in this hack, and the weapon triangle is fairly strong. It's not that there's no uses for skill, for example, there are a couple of very powerful low hit weapons, like the Chork. And being able to accurately hit throne bosses is always nice, but I don't think it has received as much of a glow up as resistance and especially luck have. On the topic of changes to weapons, Code of the Burger King has infinite durability irons. While higher tiers of weapons such as throwables, silvers, and effective weapons do have durability, if you're just using the generic weapon, then it's not going to cost you anything. I really like this change because irons are typically pretty cheap, and so I find that spending time purchasing iron swords and fire tomes isn't really engaging or strategic, it's just tedious. Of course, the risk of infinite use weapons is that it can further hoarding mentalities. After all, if an iron costs zero to use, then why use a silver? But I think enemies in Burger King are threatening enough that it really does disincentivize you from using irons for everything. It is also worth noting that while the prep shop initially only has iron weapons, the further you get in the game, the better its inventory becomes, with access to steels, silvers, and throwables eventually. This also helps to counteract the hoarding problem, because if you can buy them in preps, it's a lot easier to use the uses and not worry about the next time you'll be able to see a hand axe. There are a few other changes I want to talk about. Leadership stars exist now, both for you and for the enemy, although they only impact the accuracy, not the avoid. This is particularly impactful for one chapter that has a bunch of enemy leaders with leadership stars. On a previous version, there was a bug that caused the leadership stars to add avoid, and that map was miserable, but it has been fixed and hit rates will still be high now. Supports have also seen an overhaul. They are now built on a per chapter basis, similar to Path of Radiance and you no longer have the limitation of only 5 supports. Supporting is also a free action, so there's no reason not to do it. On the topic of free actions, this game has FE3 trading, 
or as the cringe people call it, Thracia trading, as well as many quality of life options, such as viewing enemy inventory at a glance, the ability to turn assist animations off, global range buttons, all the standard stuff. One thing that is potentially notable by its absence is save points. I'm a little spoiled as of late, and so I do kind of wish that every ROM hack had save points, but the maps in Code of the Burger King are not that long, and you get a lot of accuracy boosting tools, so it's typically pretty rare that you have to reset super late into an attempt. During my initial playthrough, I lost some strong units late into a couple of maps, and because I didn't reset, I ended up pulling people off the bench and getting to see more of this wacky cast. So if anything, it's kind of an upside? I'm not coping, you're coping. Code of the Burger King is a wonderful game that never compromises on its mechanics for its comedy, but instead meshes the two of them together so that they elevate each other. It is goofy to have a super strong and inaccurate weapon named the Chork, but this also allows for really strong anti-turtle reinforcements to show up and chase you out with the biggest numbers you've ever seen. Everyone wanting to beat up Big Chungus is funny, and him gaining the Provoke skill translates this into gameplay, but makes him a strategic part of your team. Even minor recurring gags like the Longbow General serve the purpose of giving maps mini-bosses. The gameplay is tight enough that even if you're not a fan of meme hacks, I would recommend giving this one a try. But with that being said, the comedy was good enough to win a grump like me over, so it definitely stands well on its own as well. Due to the uniqueness of the cast, and the way in which they are often defined more by special events and skills than their actual stats, I've previously described this as a spiritual successor to Tearing Saga. And while I think that's accurate to an extent, it's also selling the game a little bit short. There are so many creative ideas in here that go beyond spiritual successor to Tearing Saga. Tearing Saga doesn't have anything resembling the B-side system, and the way that skills are balanced around promoted levels versus unpromoted levels gives you the options of a cookie now or three cookies later, which can be really interesting in terms of long-term and short-term units. If you're a fan of Fire Emblem and looking for a challenge or just something new, I would highly recommend Code of the Burger King. As always, I want to take this time to thank my patrons. So thank you to Gameboo, Firent, Smas Ruby, Saxon, Seraphu58, Reflect, Robin Cars the Tribe, Marin McLean, Calamity Cali, Queen Elzium, Storm, Jamie Collins, Marin Karen, Thick Molder, Daniel Kalaskis, Jagan is a Nest, Julia Kyoto, Arvis, Bell Wenska, Tailored Muffin, George Grenville the 7th PM, SUP, Caius Cole, Gabe the Green, Control Tages, Joanna the Wrenchwitch, Juniper Chungby, Ginger, Dysyke, Autumn Kelsey, and Lilzebeth. Your generous supports are the only reason I'm even able to pump out a video once a week. After all, ad revenue certainly isn't paying the bills. If you are interested in having your name on this screen, as well as a bunch of other benefits, such as early videos, voting in polls, and some stuff that's too spicy to mention on YouTube, there is a link to my Patreon below but please only donate if you are capable of doing so financially comfortably. I don't want anyone going broke over Fire Emblem. If you're looking for free ways to help out, liking, sharing, and subscribing always boost me in the algorithm, but regardless of what you choose to do, I hope you have a wonderful day. Stay safe, gamers.